uh, one time a gentleman came running in in the middle of the noon hour and uh, he said, quick, quick, give me six cheeseburgers. My wife is out in the car having a baby. <laughs> On grill. Well, okay, we got uh, 1,200 uh, pounds of uh, beef that's come off this animal. That mets about 2,400 burgers. That's, that's a big girl right there. Three double cheese! much any kind of food. I just have one burger a week because of my cholesterol. Five Bill Street in Memphis, Tennessee, the home of the original deep fried hamburger, Dyer's world famous hamburgers. If you can only imagine the best, greasiest tasting, delicious hamburger you've ever had when you needed one the most, that's what it tastes like. Joan by the name of Elmer Dyer came up from northern Mississippi to Memphis in 1912 and started Dyer's Hamburger Restaurant. Well, back then, you know, they didn't have the flat tops and all this, so they cooked in a cast iron skillet. So, as you cook more burgers, the grease grows and you eventually it becomes a, a deep fried hamburger. We strain and process our grease daily, but we've never thrown it out and started over. So, somewhere in there is molecules from 1912. That's what makes it so good. We take the meat out, roll it into balls, take our spatula and pounder and pound it flat out, scrape it off a marble countertop and plop it in our 90-year-old grease. It sinks to the bottom and starts to cook around the edges and pretty soon it floats to the top and when it floats to the top, it's done. Take it out, take the top of the bun and go down there and get it, and you drain the grease off as much as you can. Of course, it's soaking in the top of the bun, you put it on the mustard, onion, and pickle. Every now and then, somebody grumble, there's no lesser tomato, and we explain to them why. You know, I could have it, I don't want it, because it's not our concept. And, uh, and that's part of the, of, the, of the tradition, and that's part of, the, of what the guests like also. An average day at Dyer's on Bill, we probably prepare Oh gosh, three, four, five hundred hamburgers. Because we do, we sell a lot of the double, double, and triple, triples. You may be getting one burger to your table, but it might have up to three patties on it. So it's a lot of hamburger meat. I will not disclose our secret process for seasoning the grease, because unless your grease is 91 years old, it's not going to help you anyway. You know, our t-shirts uh, for our staff ask, have you had your vitamin G today? And the G stands for grease. I first came to Dyer as the old one, probably about 20 years ago. It was a wood frame building at two doors. One said colored and one said white. And that's the way it was back then. And you went in and there was just a little stove at one end with a fan up above it. And the fan just kept going all the time, supposedly sucking the grease out, but it was just covered with grease. And these two countertops, these beautiful marble countertops, and he sat there and they flattened the burgers out, scooped them up, put them in the grease. We moved to Bill Street in March of 97. At that time, the current mayor of Memphis, who uh, was W.W. W. Harrington, uh, still is, a great customer, grew up in the area, uh, had a police escort, armored car, 
The grease was sealed in crime tape, put in the back of the armored car, and police escorted from there to this location. Stay right here. When we arrived, we had uh, both the city county mayors, uh, most of the city council, folks from Good Morning America were here to film the move, and it was uh, broadcast nationally. The old location now has a Vietnamese restaurant in it. I haven't been in there, but I understand the egg rolls are good. Yummy. I'm most proud of the fact that people come literally on veal from all over the world. Table one from Germany, table threes from, you know, uh, England, table fours from Switzerland. Uh, we've had people tell me they've come all the way from China to have our sandwiches. Pride, tradition, and grace. You know, we take pride in what we do. We have tremendous tradition, and it's all about the grace. If you are watching your health at all, I would recommend going next door. We've been doing it for 91 years, so obviously something's working. It's evolved, but yet it stayed the same. You know, the whole key is the hamburger deep fried in the, in the, in the grease, and that's not changed one bit. Ted's Restaurant, established in 1959, and we serve steamed cheeseburgers. Onion mustard for here, Kevin. In grilling, you sear the beef, so you retain uh, moisture, but you also retain some of the fat. With the steaming process, you're enveloping that pan, that stainless steel pan, in steam, and you're cooking it through. In many of people's opinion, it's a healthier way to go. But that's why I'm here, because it's healthy to eat this. When you grill a burger, this type of fat gets sealed in, and with us, it, it gets poured off. As I've found out for myself, I've, I've begun eating them without the, the bread, so I eliminate the carbs, so I eliminate the, it's kind of like a modified Atkins diet for me, myself, and I've lost about 17 pounds in, in five weeks. I know some places try to use frozen beef. We get our beef fresh four days a week, four out of six days a week. I pick it up, because I only pick up enough for the quantity I need for a day and a half or two days at the max. We have a ground special so that our burgers tend to be more like flaky. If you use uh, too fine a grind, your hamburg will be very like compact and like a little brick. The steam cheeseburger gets a bad reputation because a lot of people overcook them. They don't understand the cooking process. They use the wrong cheese. Um, I mean, this cheese is a secret. I don't know what kind of cheese he uses, but it's excellent. It's a cheddar cheese. That's as far as I'll go with the, with the specifics of the cheese. It's just people buy the wrong stuff, or they try to cut corners. Um, we've heard of one guy that used uh, orange American cheese slices on a steamed cheeseburger. I mean, it's, it's kind of insulting to, to a 44-year-old tradition. I started when I was 11, when uh, my father first opened up the place. My dad started it, and I took over on my 21st birthday, which was several years ago. Ted passed away a number of years ago. I took over in 1972. I mean, this is what I know, so, and this is what I try to do best. 
it's truly my belief that if you sell one product and you do it well, you're better off than, than selling seven different kinds of chicken salad sandwiches. Within a probably a 25 mile radius of here, there are about six or seven places that serve steamed cheeseburgers. However, we're the only place that sells 10 hot dogs a week and 800 cheeseburgers. Lettuce, tomato. I helped the guy who later patented a model called the Burger and Tender. And he would come in, Dale Greenbacker would come in on a bi-monthly basis and ask me about, you know, try this out, try this out. Each box holds um, 12 meat and 12 cheese. To my knowledge, it was started at Jack's Lunch in Middletown about 70 or 80 years ago. An old timer, a guy that was in his 70s, told me that he and another fellow, when they were like 12 or 13 years old, used to take this cart and bring it in front of Jack's Lunch and somehow fire up a steam box. It became more prominent in Meriden because there were three or four large factories going 24 hours. Meriden Rolling Mills, New Departure and International Silver Company had three shifts, so we used to be open until 4 a.m. A lot of these factory workers would just come in here uh, later and later, you know, at 4 a.m., and 90% and, uh, of them were very inebriated, and uh, it, it made for uh, interesting, uh, you know, customer relations. They could, they'd come in, and there'd be fights in here, and I'd be dragging people out, and... and and um, over the years, as the, the factories in Meriden disappeared, um, I just started closing earlier and earlier and then realized that I had open for lunch in order to make a living. Tomato and onion and lettuce. Tomato. 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 A couple of weeks ago, a kid was in here with like seven people on a Tuesday. And uh, his father told me that this was his birthday wish, that he wanted to come from Massachusetts to Ted's to eat cheeseburgers, so that was pretty cool. Every, every one of them was, we try to make perfect. I mean, I can't understand why somebody would wait outside to get in line to come in and, and do, but I mean, but they do. And I, to all those people, I, you know, thank you. William Drive In, home of the Goodburgers. It's a hamburger with melted peanut butter on it. A lot of people like them. We use about a case of peanut butter a week. I mean, in summertime, you know, but in the wintertime, we don't need it that much. But we have peanut butter shakes too. So, we use a lot of peanut butter. <laughs> Well, the Goombers started in, uh, 48. Oh, I started working here in 1960. I'm the third owner. Just working my way up. And I've been here 43 years altogether. That's a job. <laughs> you gotta work somewhere. It'd be hard to tell you, you know, per day, you know. I say 100 hamburgers, I mean, you know, 100 goo burgers or more a day. I retired 17 years ago. I've been coming here ever since I retired. I'm here about three times a day. 
I have a Goober Burgers, I'll probably eat 10,000 of them. I get my beef from my Porky's at uh, Marshall. It's uh, ground chuck. Fresh. I get it twice a week. Uh, Thursdays and uh, Mondays. Goober's been made for what, 53 years. I mean, that's a lot of peanut butter. <laughs> it's been three years. <laughs> My yeah, husband and I yeah. came here when we were dating. And we, that was about 38, 39 years ago. Yeah. John and I grew up about three blocks apart from one another, so uh, I've known him for a long time. And uh, in high school, this is where he started. He started dishwashing out here and then moved up to flipping burgers. So uh, he went from there to owning the place, or at least owning the business. And uh, I, you know, what I've always said about here is just keep it simple, and do what you do best, and that's what he's done. You know, it's nothing like it. Nowhere, I don't think. be here for a long time. It's one of the major things that we sell, next to the cheeseburger. This is Sally's Grill from Glendale, Wisconsin, right next to Milwaukee. And we serve the old fashioned butter burger. Sally's is famous for its hamburgers. My stepfather started the restaurant in 1936, and uh, we've been around for 68 years and uh, still cooking hamburgers with real butter. We get the sirloin ground up uh, from a supplier of ours who's been a supplier for many, many years. And it comes to us in a very nice patty, a quarter pound patty or a six to one pound patty. On an average day, uh, selling burgers uh, can vary so much, but we would sell anywhere from, uh, anywhere from 250 to 400 hamburgers a day. On a Saturday, we could probably reach 500. And we use fresh meat every day. We have a fresh uh, delivery of meat daily. Butter burgers, of course, are popular in the Midwest here, and especially in Wisconsin. There's not many around anymore, and especially the way we do it. Not many restaurants use the big dollop of butter that we use because, of course, butter is a very expensive commodity. Uh, a lot of places will uh, take a brush, and they'll just swipe the hamburger with a brush. We use the good old-fashioned butter in its regular state, and plop it on the hamburger, and let it melt on the hamburger as you're eating it. Butter comes from Wisconsin. I got strict orders to my supplier that I only want butter from Wisconsin. I can tell you in a week, uh, we go through anywhere between 125 to 150 pounds of butter. Real Wisconsin butter. We keep the cows alive here in Wisconsin. See, the secret, you see how the butter is dripping. The secret is eat them before the butter gets unworkable. We're going to get this dry. This plate will be dry when I'm done. 
Yeah. Almost 50 years I've been coming here, at least yeah, since right. I'm 13. There's a lot of uh, nice people that come into this restaurant. And that's, that is my favorite thing. Uh, and we have a beautiful staff working here in this restaurant. We have waitresses working here 18, 20 years. Uh, we have a cook here named Gert. Gert's been here since 1971. I'm working here, it'll be 32 years, July 20th. <laughs> the menu hasn't changed uh, much at all. Maybe a little bit more salads because people like salads. And uh, last year we added a veggie burger. That's probably uh, what's caused Sally to turn over in his grave. Sally's Grill actually started out as Bay Lunch, and that was on Green Bay Avenue. The restaurant opened up uh, maybe about a 16-seat restaurant and just a, a single counter. And then it grew to the 24 seats, which we have here today, the two uh, horseshoe counters. And he kept it going till 78 when he passed away. My mother took it over then, and then I bought it for my mother in 1993. The city of Glendale wanted to redevelop this block so they tore down some buildings, and Sally's was one of the buildings that was left. They asked us if we would like to stay here. They were nice enough to take the building, lift it up, and actually move it south about 100 feet. That move took about six months. So we were actually closed for about six months. And we were paying our employees and uh, trying to keep it going without business coming in. Now when we reopened, after six months and people have been waiting for these butter burgers it's like getting a butter burger fix uh, it's uh, it was it was a complete utter mess we had people now understand we opened up in the 12th of December now in Wisconsin the 12th of December is very very cold that day we got a 12 inch snowstorm there were hundreds of people there were people standing all the way down this aisle here, down this hallway, all the way outside the porch, all the way down the sidewalk, down the block, in 20 degree weather. When they walked in here, when we opened up, they said, doesn't look any different. They sat down and started eating the cheeseburger, uh, the butter burger. It's uh, kind of incongruous what's being built down the street right next to us here. It's called the Milwaukee Heart Hospital. And right next to the butter burger, capital of the world, we have 90-some-year-old people coming here, people that actually went to Sally's in the late 30s. Those are two gentlemen that have been coming in here since the 30s. They're still around, still eating Sally's hamburgers, so uh, I guess that says something for uh, eating cheeseburgers all your life. A long time ago, somebody gave me a plaque, and it's a real cute plaque. We have it in our front hall, and it says, uh, good food should be made with a lot of love and a lot of butter, and that's our slogan at Sally's Grill. in the middle of nowhere, you know, and the good thing about it is we're the only thing in nowhere. I'm Joe Maranto. I own the Mears Store and Restaurant in Mears, Oklahoma. Our Mears Burger is made with Texas Longhorn beef from our own Longhorn herd. Come on up. In 1836, they had the Texas Revolution, and when that was over, the, uh, uh, there was a dispute over exactly where the border was between Texas and Mexico. And all, all the ranchers in there were in this no man's land where there was constant fighting. And so uh, they left, and of course they left the cattle. And then these animals mixed, and they produced an animal that was immune to all the problems that other animals had. And the amazing thing to me is that when you have a herd that is bred up that way from wild, wild mixture, and yet they come out so gentle and so easy to handle, 
man, there that is that's an amazing thing. None of the none of the British breeds are are, are this easy. I mean, th these guys these are just range cattle. If you had a bunch of Herefords out there and they hadn't seen me, I could get I couldn't get within uh, 50 feet of them. Yeah, this is this is the future of the mirror store right here. This one makes us successful. This is it. Hi, baby. Yeah. How you doing? How you doing? To me, at first, it was just a gimmick because we were located just a mile and a half north of the Wichita Mountains Wildlife Refuge, where in 1927 they uh, uh, saved the longhorn from extinction. You see, so I mean, you know, we, there was a connection there. See, people go through the refuge and they see the longhorn cattle, and then you go to Mirror Store and you have a longhorn burger. See. Our burger is a half pound burger on a seven inch bun. We make it with uh, mustard, uh, pickles, tomatoes, green leaf lettuce, red onions, and lean Texas longhorn beef. The fat on my beef, because I raise it, I know what it is, the fat on my beef is good for you. Because the fat on my beef is yellow fat. But now you get fat white on the cow by feeding them corn. And these are the things that builds the cholesterol. But if you have yellow fat, that cow was raised on grass. That cow was raised on green feed. Yellow fat is caused by the chlorophyll and the beta carotene that's in the grass. And I'll guarantee you, it ain't going to hurt you. The average cattleman is scared of the horns. And on, on other breeds, I would be too. But these longhorns are... They know where the tip of that horn is and they know what to do with it. Look at mama taking care of her baby. That's a good mama, yeah. Longhorn cattle is the only beef breed that I know of that has a lower cholesterol in it than chicken or turkey. People who come in and buy, ch and buy chicken over beef, they just don't know any better. Our burgers are 95 to 97% lean. We make what we call a cowboy burger, which is one with mustard. That's what the cowboys like. Okay, so occasionally someone comes in here from the east, south, somewhere, they want, a, they want mayo. Why don't you put mayo on you? Well, we call that a sissy burger. We have people come in sometimes want ketchup on it. Well, we call that the Yankee burger. We think ketchup belongs on the fries, you know. Seismograph was installed here in 1985, and the purpose of it was to monitor the Mears Fault, which is a major fault that's located just two miles north of us, and it's the only uh, surface breaking fault, or, or that means the only fault that you can see from the air east of the Rocky Mountains. Since I've been doing this in 85, we've had two pretty good sized earthquake four pointers here that uh, would, uh, I, I, I just, just say this, if I have to choose between an earthquake or a tornado, I think I'll take the tornado. We've had earthquakes close to us that actually broke the, this pin. We're very sensitive, we're the most sensitive station in, in this part of the world. We picked up Russian nuclear tests. Yeah, we caught them when they were sneaking. <laughs> this is a family business, definitely a family business. I married Margie in 1983, shortly after we bought the store. Margie had two children. Peter operates our cattle operation. He's the head man, he's the cowboy in the family. And of course Margie, she's back here cooking hamburgers now, see. And, uh, that's her, that's her true love. In 1939, I believe it was, we finally got rural electric power out here. And so the business expanded and also what it allowed them to do was to start grinding hamburger meat and making hamburgers. First time I came here was 1961 and I saw the fresh ground beef, you know. I said, one of these days I'm going to own this place. But I told the owner at that time, if you ever decide to sell this place, let me know. My daddy was a butcher. When I was real small, a lot smaller than I am now, uh, I would stand on an apple crate and shove the meat into the grinder for my dad. We, we grind every day. We try to uh, keep it as fresh as we possibly can. There'll be some left over at night, which you'll start off the next day with. However, uh, we have to grind that day to keep the proper supply up. In fact, Saturday and Sunday, we just continue to grinding, basically. We sell a lot of burgers, a lot of burgers. They wait in line for the burgers. They come in here hungry and they leave full. And that's, that's a very satisfying to me, to know that I took care of their needs. And uh, 
They came here because they wanted to come here. This road is a destination point. This is where people go to. See, you don't go by, you go to. I've been around here a long time. I was, I was born in 1930. Makes me 73 years old right now. I've eaten beef all my life. My daddy was a butcher. You know, and I mean, uh, 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 hadn't hurt me any. Cat Bite Restaurant, and we're located in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Green chili cheeseburgers, that's what we're known for. Green chilies are hot. It's indigenous to New Mexico, and it's essential, I think, to New Mexico. It's a common food in New Mexico. There's not very many families that don't include green chili in every one of their meals. It actually causes pain in your tongue, and your brain says, oh, let's send endorphins to that area, which is the body's natural opiates, and you get kind of a rush. It's very subtle, but it's a real rush. I'm going to estimate that we probably go through about 80 pounds of chili a week. We're very popular with the green chili growers. We like them and they like us. The restaurant has been here for almost 50 years. Prior to that, it was a trading post and a gun shop. It's been in the same family since the beginning. It's my grandma and grandpa, Don and Shelba Searles, were here for 10 years, and my, grand and my parents were here for 22 years, Bobby and Judy Amos. The Bobcat sits on a 100-acre ranch, and in its day it used to be a working quarter horse ranch. There were so many Bobcats in the area that the Bobcats would come and sit and perch on the roof of the restaurant. The lady that owned the ranch at the time, she decided to call the restaurant Bobcat Bite. The scraps used to be thrown out the back in the early evening, and the bobcats and the wolves would come down in the evening and eat. I think initially that's where a lot of the, the reputation of the, of the bobcat came from. People would come down in the evenings just to watch the, the bobcat and the wildlife eat here. As our old customers travel, we receive things in the mail. They run across a bobcat picture, and they'll send it to us, and we frame it and hang it. The Green Chili Cheeseburger has been here since 1953, since it opened. It's always been on the menu, forever. Customers work with us. Somebody will come in and, and they realize how tiny we are. We, we can only seat 26. They'll pull up with a bus and say we have 35 people. And they realize that they have to wait. They'll eat in shifts. We have, they'll fill up the counter. When table's empty, they'll come in. A lot of times they'll let some of our local people come in ahead of them. We have had some of our customers tell us that they, they were out there for an hour, but it's well worth the wait. And that makes us feel good. The burger is really pretty much ground steak. You know, I cut up these big chucks, they come out in just big steaks, and then we grind them up. Grinding it fresh um, every morning, using chuck shoulder and um, chuck tenders. It just doesn't get any fresher than this. We grind our own meat. We know what goes into them. We can control the fat content. 
All our patties are handmade. I make them yes. by hand, in nine and a half ounces. I was a tile setter for about 10 years. And if you can be a tile setter for 10 years, you can do the most tedious tasks in the world. We hand make them into patties, and that takes about an hour every morning. Put them back into buckets, and then take them from the buckets, and kind of compress them. Put them on the grill. It's all gone by the end of the evening. <laughs> we run out periodically. We've actually, this past summer, when we did run out, have one of our customers say, well, I'll just run down to the store, pick up some burger and bring it back, and you can cook it for me. And I thought, no, no, we can't do that, yeah, you know? Really um, do that. You know, because we do grind our own. It tastes a lot different. They wouldn't be very happy with what they got. Because this has been a restaurant for almost 50 years. Um, they did have a curfew, and we were told that uh, people had to be out of establishments before 8 o'clock and home. The hamburger as a, a factory product has become ubiquitous and just too similar to the point where every city has lost its uh, it's individuality. I love burgers. I really do. I do not order them when I go out anywhere just because um, I feel like this is the best. <laughs> My grandfather's name was Louie, and that's where we got our name. My grandfather invented the steak sandwich, and as a byproduct, we made the first hamburger sandwiches in the United States. What year was that? 1900. Both products evolved in 1900. Welcome to Louie's. Your hands are nice and warm. How are you? Good. Yourself? Good. Hi. That's a good handshake. How are you? A good handshake. We're here at Louie's Lunch, and it is the birthplace of the hamburger sandwich. And that was in the year 1900. We've been in business since 1895, which would be 108 years. Yes, my grandfather was very health-minded, and he ran across these stoves. And they're dated 1898, and from the time he opened up until now, our whole menu revolves around the stoves. Burgers are cooked vertically with a flame on either side um, and the uh, juices can drop in a, a pan below. The broilers are the original ones that my husband's grandfather cooked the first hamburgers. And the date on them is 1898. I married Ken in 1951 and came right to work at Louie's. When I had to work and the kids were in school, when they got out of school, then we'd have to bring them down here so we could keep an eye on them. Anybody else waiting for water? Please. So while they were here, this will work. Peel onions, wash dishes. Those were the days before dishwashers, you know. It's uh, ground fresh every day. We cut and grind it ourselves. Actually, you're getting ground steak. All we add is all salt and pepper and TLC. Our hamburgers are five to eight percent fat. So they're pretty lean babies. 
high up in Florida. Yeah, Florida. That's the toaster. Because the first burgers were made on toast. And we've kept that tradition right through the years. That's the way grandfather started them. And so we've kept them that way right along. They're not served on buns, just on toast. It's a cheese spread, a cheddar spread. Because you can't cook cheeseburger on these broilers because they go it goes in sideways and it will stick right to the grill and it'll all melt. Yep. I was at McDonald's, but not for a burger. I went for the fish fillet. I haven't had a hamburger anywhere except Louis in 53 years. Ketchup is a very strong flavor. If we put that on the sandwiches, it'll destroy every single thing we're trying to give you. My great-grandfather made the first one. He made it without ketchup, and uh, one, we like to adhere to uh, his standards back then. And number two, we uh, honestly and truly believe you don't need it, because it's the best burger there is. The original address in my time was on the corner of George and Temple Streets, which is two and a half blocks away. And the redevelopment agency was bound and determined it was going to tear us down. The city wanted to tear us down to make room for a doctor's building, um, uh, the property we did not own. Uh, so uh, my father fought the city in New Haven for uh, roughly 10 years to, for survival. And a week before uh, we were supposed to be closed up and moved, um, we were able to buy this piece of land uh, from a lady in Florida who read about it in a newspaper article down in Florida, who was actually originally from New Haven at one time. I remember riding on the back of the truck when the building was brought up here. I know from the corner of Georgian Temple to come up to this location, it took 45 minutes. My father's idea of moving up here in 75 uh, when the city made us move was definitely the uh, smartest and the best move there was. No, this was in my father's age. He redesigned this building in 1929. And there's, if you felt here, there's an original counter from the lunch wagon that I've never even seen. My dad said it was all carved up like everything else around here. I'm lucky it's not me. I believe it was uh, somewhere in the early 70s. Uh, someone uh, in the McDonald's Corporation or Chain of Command somewhere on the East Coast uh, had come to my father and uh, had made an offer to him to uh, purchase Louis, uh, and it was at that time a rather large sum of money. She quickly declined, you know, uh, that's my father. He, money has no bearing on him, it's all about history and pride and family. We try to keep that tradition going today. My name is Sam Sianis. This is the famous Billy Goat Tavern and Grill. You guys too late, I ordered doubles. I'm 
named after Billy Goat, so I'm Billy Goat Jr., I guess. <laughs> the Billy Goat started back 1934. Well, over by the Chicago Stadium, the bar was down, my uncle lived upstairs, he come down one day and he found a little baby goat by the door. He got the baby goat, took him inside his place and started feeding him milk. My great uncle, Billy Goat, he, he used to keep a goat in the place. Uh, they used to be his mascot. He used to take it everywhere, conventions, baseball games, everywhere. They used to know him. The Cubs were in the World Series in 1945 against the Detroit Tigers. The last game here, they were tight 3-3, uh, and the last game they played here in Chicago. He got two tickets, he goes over there, he tried to get in, and they refused to let him in. He says, uh, don't allow goats at the game. The guys go upstairs, ask Mr. Wrigley, tell him uh, a billy goat down here, and he wants to take the goat. So Mr. Wrigley says, uh, well, let the billy goat inside, but not the goat, because the goat smells. Then my uncle, he left one back to his tavern, and when the cops lost, you know, and then, then he sent a telegraph to Mr. Wrigley, and he says, who smells now? They lost that series and they've never gone since, 1945. So whenever the Cubs start, to start winning, the, the Billy Go Hex is brought up because, you know, is this going to be the end of the Hex or not? Will the curse of the Billy Goat come to an end tonight? And whatever you do, don't mention the four-legged creature, Ixnay, on the Go Day talk. Hey, Cubs fan, up here, give me some of your old style. Huh? The Croizen old style. Give me some and I'll lift the curse. Didn't you lift the curse? In your lifetime, have you ever heard the phrase world champion Chicago Cubs? <sighs> no. Hurts a little, doesn't it? Oh, yeah. Why do people keep doing that? Croizen old style. Brewed once for taste, twice for smoothness. When the Chicago Stadium needed parking out there, we had to move from there. So I moved here in 1964, and everything has been the same since. We do sell a lot of cheese, but just sometimes we go, we go about 1,500, over 1,000 a day, depends on. Well, it depends if, like today, we're going to do that, over 2,000 today. Is we probably could go over 200,000, 300,000 a year, patties. Double we have a sign upstairs, but it's difficult to see. We're located in Lower Michigan Avenue, but a lot of people still end up finding us. Cheese, double cheese, double cheese, double cheese, double cheese. Here you go, sir. Thank you. Triple much better. It's a fresh hamburger every day. We make the patties ourselves. You're gonna get a fresh product every day. I buy it from the butcher down at, uh, in Rad Dog Street. I ground the meat, trim the fat, throw the fat away. It's a pure beef. I cut the rolls. They are uh, uh, like homemade bread. Yeah. The pickles, we got the best pickles. The guy make it special for me. Then a lot of people come in from all over and they want a recipe. Uh, we never had a fries here. Yeah. There was no room, that's why we didn't have any fries here. We had no fries here. Cheeseburger, 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 cheeseburger. No Pepsi Coke and no fried chips. We walk on the Michigan Avenue and I say something, hey, cheeseburger. Dave kind of says to me, you know why they call you that? I says, you, they have you on TV. And then when it came out in uh, 70, 78, um, my dad didn't know about it. Step down, step down, cheeseburger, 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 double cheese. And over here, we got the people coming in. They want me to say, hey, say it. They see me down the street. Hey, say it. You know, any place they see me. How about you, lady, double? Double cheese the best. President Clinton came to Chicago. Miss Clinton came over here. She came here. They want me to say, well, you in Chicago? Yes. Where are the Billy Goats? Then you're in Chicago. No fries, chips, and no Pepsi Coke. There's six kids all together. Um, I'm the oldest. You know, all of us have gone through school. I've uh, I got a degree in architecture. My brother has a degree in law. 
steak in the bar. We got another accountant. We got a computer animator. But well, we all pretty much, you know, come back here to work at uh, at the Billy Goat to help out my dad and everything. Keep the keep it going. I always tell my kids and all of them, just not uh, Billy, all of my sisters, you going, you going to a school, learn. You know, want to be architect, the other guy wants to be a lawyer, a CPA, the other one wants to be a cartoonist or whatever. But you go to school and get something in here. Then you can go to business. Okay? Because anytime you got something inside here, that's yours. Nobody's going to take it away from you. Excuse me. What do you got? Probably the guy who discovered the cheeseburger. That was one year after I born. The problem we had in his mind. One of these days, this guy just born a year ago, he might come here to the United States and make the cheeseburger very famous. <laughs> Well, I could, I could tell you, but so informed I'd have to kill you. I've never eaten in a, in a burger in my life other than here. Look myself, it's not Wendy's, not Burger King, not Lulu, McDonald's. The trouble with the world is this, you've got people who know what they know, they know they know. You have people who don't know, and they don't know they don't know. Yes, I want you guys to try one before you leave. In my time off, I like to fish a lot, or garden, and, uh, and do a little artwork. I used to do a little artwork, yeah. I don't have much time for it anymore. When I was 16 years old, I lived near the zoo in Memphis and I wanted to be a veterinarian. In my time off, I melt down quite a bit. It just takes a lot of energy, but, but I do like to do projects at home. Right now I'm building a pond. But for lunch, for lunch I usually have a salad and sometimes I eat hebrew too. Uh, because my, my hebrew, I'm not worried about getting fat because uh, it's, it's very lean. Don't think about it. That's what she is. I ordered already for you. Yeah.